When Brigida Uto arrived at the emergency department, she was on the brink of death. While her vital signs were rapidly deteriorating, doctors couldn't find any signs of injury or infection. Medical professionals, FBI agents, and the police all came together to solve not only the medical mystery but also to uncover the horrifyingly inventive crime. On March 5, 2018, the medical staff at a hospital in San Diego, California, was awaiting the arrival of a 28-year-old patient named Brigida. She was being transported by an ambulance from her family doctor's office. On that day, Brigida called her mother, Olga, complaining of feeling unwell. Olga struggled to get her into the car. Brigida could barely breathe, and her legs trembled with excruciating pain. With just one look at the once vibrant and healthy young woman, the family doctor knew that Brigida was in critical condition and there was nothing he could do for her. Therefore, he called an ambulance to take her to the clinic. The emergency department medics were also alarmed that they might not be able to stabilize the patient's condition. Brigida was in unbearable pain, could hardly see anything, could barely speak, and had no sensation in her feet or hands. But the most puzzling symptom was that her once beautiful chestnut hair was falling out in clumps. The doctors began their work. They quickly determined that there were no external signs of trauma on her body. No bruises, wounds, or indications of infection. The cause of her illness was internal. Brigida's mother explained that her daughter had been suffering from sudden episodes of nausea, fatigue, and excruciating pain for several months. The symptoms would occur suddenly without any warning, causing her to spend days in bed. Brigida could barely take care of herself, let alone her husband and young son. Various specialists she consulted were at a loss, unable to understand what was afflicting her. Her symptoms did not match any known illness. One doctor even told her that her case was how critical days manifest. Finally, the doctors concluded that it was a result of stress and prescribed her tranquilizers. However, her condition worsened, her body was failing, and the medical staff in the emergency department of San Diego understood that if they didn't figure out what was wrong with her as soon as possible, the patient could die within days. Brigida grew up in California, just a few kilometers away from the border with Mexico. Her father worked at the customs between Mexico and the United States, while her mother took care of their two daughters, Brigida and her younger sister Olga. The girls grew up in a loving and caring family. Brigida happily attended a Catholic school, excelling in her studies. Her friends described her as the friendliest and kindest girl they knew. Brigida had a passion for running and even participated in competitions, representing her school. It was through running that she met her future husband, Race Remington Uto. They met in high school. Race attended a different school but was also passionate about sports. At first, Brigida's family didn't pay much attention to their friendship because their daughter wasn't interested in dating boys. Her time was consumed by studying and sports. However, gradually, the young couple became more and more involved with each other and started dating. Race managed to bring out a more adventurous side of Brigida, and soon they became inseparable. Race had a highly ambitious goal. He dreamt of attending the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis. The acceptance rate for students was less than 8%, making it a challenging task. The applicant had to excel in school, work on personal development, engage in sports, participate in community life, engage in volunteer work, and much more. Surprisingly, Race managed to gain admission to the academy, and he moved to Maryland to begin his education. The young couple continued their relationship long distance. However, after some time, Race was diagnosed with a hernia that didn't resolve completely. He had to leave the academy but found work as an electrician in the Navy. Meanwhile, Brigida pursued her own plans and became a teacher. In 2014, after seven years of being together, 25-year-old Brigida and 24-year-old Race got married. Soon after, they welcomed their son. Brigida believed she was perfectly happy, 
with everything in her life going according to plan. She had a loving, caring husband, a wonderful child, and lived just steps away from her parents. However, her life would soon take an extraordinary and painful turn that she could never have imagined. Among the emergency department physicians at San Diego Hospital, there was a certified toxicologist named Dr. Jeff Lapointe, which was considered rare. He was a true medical detective, and like an excellent detective, Lapointe followed the trail of clues that could lead him to understand what was happening to Bridget. Was she being killed by an autoimmune disease? No, blood tests did not confirm that. Could she be suffering from cancer? No, although one symptom stood out among all others, hair loss was not due to the disease but rather a result of therapy. All the symptoms indicated that Bridget had been exposed to a toxic chemical. But which one, and how? Was it arsenic, cadmium, or cesium? No, because these heavy metals wouldn't result in hair loss. However, there was one substance that could, thallium. In the early 20th century, thallium was used as a depilatory agent. It was also actively utilized by doctors. For example, if a child had head lice, thallium was applied to their head, causing the lice to fall off along with all the hair. In subsequent years, thallium became the main component of rodent poisons. However, by the 1970s, its popularity as a murder weapon, alongside arsenic, had increased to the point where it was banned for sale and use. All of Bridget's symptoms, including leg pain, weakness, deteriorating vision, loss of appetite, weight loss, and, of course, hair loss, indicated thallium poisoning. The problem was that Dr. Lapointe couldn't confirm his suspicions quickly. Nobody in the hospital had encountered such a case before, and there was no way to test the patient for poisoning. The samples had to be sent to another laboratory, and the results would be available in three days. Three days that Bridget might not have. The race against time had begun. Lapointe started calling all the agencies, requesting an expedited analysis. But even if the doctor's suspicions proved to be correct and Bridget was suffering from thallium poisoning, the antidote would be urgently needed. However, obtaining the antidote, poetically named Berlin Blue, turned out to be more challenging than he could ever imagine. We have all seen Berlin Blue because it is a blue pigment used in paints. Vincent van Gogh used it when painting Starry Night over the Rhone. This substance is also an antidote for poisoning by certain heavy metals, accelerating their elimination from the body. However, while you can buy blue paint at the nearest art supply store, obtaining medical grade Berlin Blue is almost unrealistic. Lapointe called all the pharmacies, naval medical officers, clinics, but he found the antidote only at one warehouse, a classified warehouse in Los Angeles. The thing is, Berlin Blue is also an antidote for radiation exposure, such as in the case of a dirty bomb explosion. Therefore, the government keeps meticulous records of every tube of Berlin Blue in the country. And Dr. Lapointe couldn't count on getting the antidote until thallium poisoning was confirmed in the laboratory. When the toxicological analysis of Bridget's case arrived, Lapointe's worst fears were confirmed. The level of thallium in Bridget's body exceeded the permissible limit by a thousand times. A hospital staff member drove all night to bring the antidote to San Diego. However, the doctor feared that with such a severe poisoning, one antidote might not be sufficient. He prescribed dialysis for the patient to cleanse her blood. It was a slow and painful process, and now all the medical staff and Bridget's family could do was wait and pray. Meanwhile, Bridget's husband and son were placed in another wing of the hospital to monitor their health. If she had been exposed to thallium, they could have been affected too. The main question remained, where could she have obtained such a large quantity of thallium? And the answer to that was being sought by FBI agents. It should be understood that all this was happening in a state with several military bases. Furthermore, these events unfolded against the backdrop of President Trump's planned visit. Therefore, when Dr. Lapointe started looking for Berlin Blue, the FBI agents became very interested in what was happening in the city. 
FBI agents and police have discovered that several months ago, Bridget underwent treatment at an alternative medicine clinic in Mexico, when she began experiencing an unexplained illness. The police investigated this lead but ultimately dismissed it. The school where Bridget taught was a former military base during World War II, where rodent poisoning could have occurred in the past. In that year, many teachers at the school fell ill. However, this lead also turned out to be a dead end. Investigators could not dismiss the possibility that Bridget had used thallium herself as a cry for attention due to her depression. But everyone who knew her claimed that she loved life and would never abandon her son. Furthermore, her depression emerged after the appearance of unexplained symptoms, not the other way around. Dr. Lapointe had his own suspicions about how his patient had been poisoned. He conducted a scan of Bridget's internal organs and was horrified to discover numerous white spots throughout her digestive tract. It became evident that the poison was entering her body through food. Someone close to her had attempted the perfect crime. Dr. Lapointe ordered complete isolation for the patient, allowing no one to visit her or provide her with food except what was provided by the hospital. However, at that moment, food was the least of her concerns. Bridget regained consciousness thanks to the antidote after a few days. All her hair had fallen out, and she couldn't sit or move, but she was alive. She couldn't name anyone who would wish her harm. However, the police knew that poisoning is always a personal crime committed by a close friend or family member. It was also interesting that Bridget's husband and child were unharmed. The police spoke with her sister, parents, and husband, all of whom were eager to help with the investigation. Ray wept and lamented that he couldn't switch places with his wife to relieve her suffering. He said what the detectives wanted to hear, yet investigators sensed falsehood in his words. The medical staff also noted that he didn't seem as concerned and asked strange and sometimes inappropriate questions. Response to the suspicion regarding her husband's involvement, Bridget became angered and vehemently denied it. She insisted that Ray had been caring for her when she was unwell, taking care of their son and bringing her to the hospital. Furthermore, he would prepare meals when she lacked the strength to get out of bed. However, during the conversation with Bridget, the investigators learned something that sent chills down their spines. Ray had a rather unusual hobby. He enjoyed collecting rare seeds of poisonous plants. This piqued the police's interest, and after 16 days of Bridget's hospitalization, the police gathered enough evidence to search their home. Ray opened the door and appeared somewhat agitated. The detectives asked him to hand over all the family's gadgets, and he willingly surrendered all the phones and laptops. However, he couldn't help but notice that all the search histories on the devices had recently been cleared. Despite the supposedly deleted data on his phone, the police found two books in Ray's mobile, Criminal Poisoning, and The Poisoner's Handbook. According to The Poisoner's Handbook, Thallium gives the poisoner the ability to control how quickly their victim dies. The poisoning presents itself as a medical enigma, with the patient slowly deteriorating for unknown reasons. There were even more intriguing discoveries. In Ray's car, they found a canister of acetone and a packet of exotic seeds hidden in a small compartment in the spare tire. Additionally, Bridget's sister handed over a black garbage bag that she retrieved from the trash bin, as their mother noticed Ray throwing it away just before the police arrived. Inside were receipts for exotic seeds such as tick seed, prayer nut, and Cerbera odolum, along with various tools for their filtration and grinding. In other words, everything necessary for the production of rare poisons. It was evident that the man had already attempted to crush tick seed seeds to obtain ricin, a poison toxic to mice but dangerous to humans if inhaled or ingested. The detective's suspicions grew, but there were no traces of thallium found in the house, garage, or car. Therefore, there was no basis for arresting Ray. All they could do was share their suspicions with Bridget and ask her not to return home. She still couldn't believe their words, but she didn't object to the continuation of the investigation. The investigators continued to dig deeper and discovered a possible motive for the murder. Ray had a lover who believed he was a widower. 
He lied to her, claiming to be a Navy SEAL and expressing his goal to work for the FBI in the poisoning division. He didn't hesitate to bring his young son on their dates, and the boy had grown so attached to the woman that he called her mom. Leading a double life, Ray went even further and started another affair, confessing to the woman that he was married. However, he hoped that his wife would be hit by a bus, so he wouldn't have to share custody of their son. It's unclear why this didn't alarm the woman. Nonetheless, it was clear that the man wanted to end his relationship with Bridget. But as a devout Catholic, she had warned him before their marriage that she did not believe in divorce and that if they married, it would be for life. She could hardly have expected her unfaithful husband to take this ending so literally. The detectives asked Ray to undergo a polygraph test, which he failed miserably. When the polygraph examiner informed him of the results, he didn't attempt to deny it and confessed to everything. Race stated that he ordered thallium online three times. In August 2017, he first attempted to add it to his wife's food by preparing her a sandwich for breakfast. He calculated the amount of thallium based on her weight. The next day, Bridget felt unwell, but it didn't kill her. She started to recover. In December of the same year, Race added a slightly larger amount of thallium to the soup. Again, he didn't achieve the desired effect. In January, he increased the dosage fivefold and once again hid the poison in a sandwich. He intended to kill Bridget within days. She felt terrible, experienced excruciating pain, and began losing her hair, but she continued to fight for her life. After confessing, Race was arrested. Eight months later, he pleaded guilty to three attempts to murder his wife. His lawyer tried to argue that Race suffered a spinal injury while serving in the Navy, and the pain clouded his judgment. However, this defense did not help. On March 14, 2019, he was sentenced to three life imprisonments ranging from 21 years to life. He may be eligible for parole in October 2033. If he is lucky and succeeds in his first attempt at freedom, he will serve only 14 years in prison and become a free man before his 42nd birthday. During the trial, Bridget was finally able to address her husband personally. She said, I wanted to believe that I knew the man I married three years ago, the man I had been dating for nearly 10 years. I wanted to believe that he would never harm me. I am horrified by the thought that he could be responsible for attempting to kill me. How could you do this to the mother of your child? Why do you think you have the right to decide that I am not a worthy mother for your son? How could you decide that the way to end our marriage is by slowly killing your wife, watching her suffer for months? I cared for you, and I loved you. Every time Bridget recalls the incident, she breaks into a cold sweat. She felt unwell and was lying in bed. Her husband brought her a sandwich with peanut butter. Their little son climbed onto the bed and asked for a bit. Race immediately shouted at her not to give him any. Bridget doesn't know if there was thallium in that sandwich, but she believes her son was at least on the brink of severe poisoning. Despite Bridget's reluctance to admit divorce, she eventually divorced Race. She still suffers from constant fatigue, weakness in her legs, and nerve damage. However, she is gradually recovering and has returned to work at a school for children with special needs. She admits that now it is much easier for her to find an approach to each student. Bridget, who once couldn't walk, is now running again, trying skydiving, and striving to live life to the fullest.